Hi everyone and welcome or welcome back to my channel. So in today's video I am bringing you my August reading wrap up. I read a lot of books in August and I've been a little bit scared <laughs> to film this video but I'm going to try and power through and keep my reviews nice and short. I think in total I read 13 books and then I also DNF'd technically two but I only read the first chapter of the one so I don't know whether to even count it. All the books that I read last month were either Kindle books, audio books or library books. I was taking part in a Kindle reading challenge with Helen so I was trying to prioritise reading ebooks and then I had a couple of library holds as well that I needed to get through so I don't actually have a stack to show you for this video but I read some great books in August. I'm going to go in order of star rating so I'm going to start with the DNF and then I'm going to finish with my favourite book of the month which I think is also going to be my favourite book of the year so yeah yeah, I hope you're ready for this video. I don't know how long it's going to take me to film. I'm a little bit scared, but we're going to get stuck into it. There will be timestamps in the description just in case you would like to skip around. The first book that I have to talk about is my DNF of the month, and that was Only When It's Us by Chloe Lise. This wasn't bad, and I think I would read other books by this author. However, I realised quite quickly that I wasn't in the mood to read this. It's a new adult contemporary college romance where one of the main characters characters is a soccer player and the love interest is this guy that she sits next to in class. The main reason why I DNF'd is because you learn very quickly that the main character's mom is in hospital and she has terminal cancer and August was the five year anniversary of when I finished chemo so it was already quite a difficult month. I just wasn't in a good headspace to read this especially because it seemed like it was going to be quite a significant part of the plot so yeah I put this down it wasn't bad, it was just not going to be for me. The other book that I DNF'd after one chapter was The Bookshop and the Barbarian by Morgan Stang. This is a cosy fantasy that's been compared to Legends and Lattes and yeah I read the first chapter and did not like the writing style. It's told in second person perspective as if the narrator is talking to you. So I actually like second person POV when it's done in a certain way. So if the narrator is talking to someone else in the story or if they're talking to themselves like you're hearing their internal monologue. I love that, I find it really immersive but when the narrator is talking to me as the reader I find it really uncomfortable <laughs> and I find that it takes me out of the story rather than drawing me in. So yeah I DNF'd this after one chapter and I probably won't go back to it. Moving on to my one two star read of the month and that was unfortunately Lady Macbeth by Ava Reed. This was one of my most anticipated releases for 2024. I loved two of this author's other books. So I read A Study in Drowning last year and really enjoyed it, solid four stars. And then I think the year before I read The Wolf and the Woodsman and that was also a four stars. So I wasn't expecting to give this five stars but I was expecting it to be another solid four star read. And unfortunately I was really bored. I can vaguely remember studying at Macbeth when I was in school but I would have been like 11 or 12 so my memory is a bit hazy. All I can really remember is that this guy Macbeth is told this prophecy by three witches that he's going to become the King of Scotland and he's encouraged to fulfil this prophecy by his wife Lady Macbeth. So Lady Macbeth in the original play is portrayed as someone who is ruthless and ambitious and the main character Rossiel in this book was none of that. Even though I don't have any kind of attachment to the original story, I found the main character in this so dull and bland. She had no personality. There was a love interest that felt really pointless and the fantasy elements also felt kind of random and out of place. So yeah, I gave this one two stars. The atmosphere was okay, but mostly I was annoyed that I wasted my time reading it. Next that we have what turned out to be another disappointing 2024 release and that was Not In Love by Ali Hazelwood. This follows a main character who works for a company that is being taken over by another company and the love interest is someone that works for this other company but they actually met before any of this happened and they have this attraction to each other that they want to explore so they start this friends with benefits type situation. I really 
appreciated the author's note at the beginning of this because I think that does really set expectations for this story. It's more emotional and erotic than Ali Hazelwood's other books and I think that's why it didn't work for me. The entire middle section was basically sex scene after sex scene and I started to find it really boring and tedious and repetitive. The emotional aspects also felt kind of surface level to me so I gave it three stars. It was fine. I think if you want a romance where the love interest is besotted with the main character, he falls first and he adores her, then I think this could work for you better than it did for me because I think that was the main strength of the book. Next on my list is The Girl in the Ice by Robert Brinzer, which is a crime thriller following a detective who investigates after a body is found in a frozen lake in a London park. This is the first book in the Erica Foster series and I haven't decided yet whether I'm going to continue the series because I found this first book just fine. It was very fast-paced and I liked how it felt grounded within the setting. You could tell that this was set in London and I thought the atmosphere was done reasonably well. The main thing that I didn't enjoy was the main character though. Considering she's meant to be this super experienced detective, she was acting really recklessly and she wasn't thinking things through and I started to find her really frustrating so yeah even though this was a good time at the time I don't know whether I'm that fussed about continuing the series considering I read some other crime thrillers in August that I really loved and that I've already continued the series this is just not really a priority right now. Next up we have another 3.5 stars and that was The Flames of Albion by Jean Mingus. So this was a really enjoyable cozy fan to see about a woman who lives and works at this university. One day she's cleaning this dragon egg that everyone assumed was a fossil until it starts to hatch and the book is basically about their bond and also there's a sapphic romance with another dragon rider who comes to this university to help our main character learn how to be a companion of a dragon. This was really cute and cozy and wholesome with really likeable characters. I would have liked a little more character development but otherwise this delivers delivered exactly what it promised to deliver. So uh, yeah, 3.5 stars. The ending does set things up where it's clear that there's going to be a sequel. However, I don't know if that sequel is still going to be coming because I've looked online and I can't find any information about it. And this book did come out a few years ago now. So yeah, that was the only thing that kind of irritated me at the end because I don't think this actually needed a sequel. I think the mystery of the the book could have been wrapped up in one volume. Moving on to some four star reviews and first up we have One Perfect Couple by Ruth Ware. This was another of my anticipated releases for 2024 and thankfully I did enjoy it. However, it wasn't what I was expecting. So you're told in the synopsis that this follows a main character whose boyfriend convinces her to go on this reality TV show that's filming on this beautiful remote tropical island. You also know from the synopsis that a storm hits this island and they end up stranded there and it turns into this survival story. The marketing has compared this to And Then There Were None by Agatha Christie. However, I don't agree with that because when I hear that comparison, I think, okay, this book is going to be a closed circle murder mystery and that's not what this book is. I would describe it as a suspense and I would compare it more to Lord of the Flies, which was one of my favourite classics when I was a teenager. So this worked for me. I liked the tension and the slow build-up, but I can also understand why some people have been disappointed because the reality TV element also isn't really that much of a thing within the plot after the beginning and the initial setup. Next up we have Flowers for Algernon by Daniel Keyes, which I read because I needed to read a book outside my comfort zone for a vlog that I was filming and this is a little outside my comfort zone because it came out in the 60s so I think it's considered a modern classic and having read the book I can understand why. Even though I personally didn't give it five stars I appreciated the messages that the book was trying to get across. So this is about a guy called Charlie who's in his early 30s and he has an unusually low IQ. He's taken part in an experiment that's meant 
to increase his IQ and I thought the writing in this was really effective because it's told through a series of diary entries or progress reports that this guy is writing, documenting his time while taking part in this experiment and the subtle way that the writing changes throughout the book. I felt like it was really effective, it drew me into the story and it helped me feel close to this man. I didn't realise that there's actually two versions of this story. There was a short story that came out in the 50s and then it was expanded into a full-length novel which is what I read and I would really like to read the short story at some point because there were moments in the novel where I felt like the pacing was dragging and where stuff was being introduced but not expanded as much as I wanted it to be expanded and I think that the messages that the book was trying to get across I think you could get that across in a short story and it would feel more concise. One of the main themes that this book explores is intelligence and the way that people treat others based on perceived intelligence. I didn't realise how emotionally invested I was until I started crying at the end so yeah. Glad that I read this even though it wasn't a five stars for me. Next on my list is Assistant to the Villain by Hannah Nicole Mayra which I was not expecting to give four stars. I bought this in a 99p Kindle deal last year and at the time I'd heard a bit of buzz about it, it was getting a bit of hype on TikTok and it sounded like it was going to be a fun time. I then heard nothing but bad things about it and it put me off reading it because I don't want to read a book that I'm not going to enjoy. Should have ignored the negative reviews because this ended up really working for me and I feel like I need to try and get across the tone of the book because it's completely unserious. It follows a main character who accepts a job working for the villain. It's set in this very generic medieval fantasy world and the world building wasn't great. <laughs> there was some stuff that didn't make sense but I wasn't reading this for the world building. I was reading this for the grumpy sunshine dynamic and the relationship between the main character and the villain. I thought this was so funny and it's the kind of humour that I think is either going to work for you or it's not. It's a very dry and sarcastic sense of humour and I think you'll know within the first few chapters whether you're going to like it or not. The main reason this wasn't five stars was because I didn't love the ending. There was a character who had a complete personality transplant and it didn't make any sense but I was willing to overlook that and I definitely will continue with the series. I think the second book came out this month actually. In August I also discovered an author who I have become obsessed with. I read three books by Mike Omer and I thought it would make sense to talk about them all together because I don't want to repeat myself and also I gave all of these between four and five stars. So I started by reading the first two books in the Abby Mullen series and then I got to the end of book two and I had a feeling that there was going to be a crossover with the Zoe Bentley series which was a series that he published first. So I've now started that series as well and my goal is to finish the Zoe Bentley series and then go back and read book three in the Abby Mullen series. I don't think it really matters that much but I'm a completionist and I thought I like this author's writing, it makes sense to just go back and try and read them in order even though I didn't do that to start with. The Abby Mullen series follows a police negotiator in New York and then the Zoe Bentley series follows a forensic psychologist working for the FBI. So these books are quite dark. The Zoe Bentley series is a little more graphic than the Abby Mullen series. The audiobooks for these are also all available on Everend. I think I read the first book in the Abby Mullen series physically and then I was alternating with the audiobook but the rest of the series I've just been listening to the audiobooks because I do like the narration. Hope to Die by Cara Hunter was another crime thriller that I read in August and this I think is my favourite in this series so far. So this is book six in the D.I. Adam Fawley series which is a British crime thriller series set in Oxford and you follow a team of detectives where in each book they're investigating a different crime. Cara Hunter is so good at writing compelling stories with lots of twists and turns, some of which I never see come in. She also tends to include multimedia in her books and I love it when authors do that because to me 
it helps bring a story to life and make it feel more grounded in reality. So yeah, Hope to Die was five stars for me. I think it's my favourite in the series so far, but I also really loved book four. If you haven't checked out this series yet, then I would really recommend it. Or if you don't want to commit to a series, then I would also recommend Cara Hunter's Standalone, which came out last year and I can't remember the name of it, Murder in the Family. That was a solid four stars for me and that one is told entirely in multimedia. Okay, we only have two books left to talk about in this wrap up and in second place, my second favourite book of the month was You Again by Kate Goldbeck. This is a contemporary romance that's very much inspired by When Harry Met Sally. I'm not usually the biggest fan of Friends to Lovers as a trope, except when you actually get to see the characters become friends. And that's what this book did. You follow them over the course of almost a decade, I think. I loved how messy and realistic the characters felt and how this really focused on their relationship and how even though they were complete opposites, somehow it kind of worked. I think if you like romance books where there's a plot alongside the romance, then this might not work for you because it does very much focus on the relationship between these two characters. Also, I loved the setting in this. It takes place in New York, and I almost read it when I went to New York earlier this year, but I didn't get around to it. And there were references to places that I could visualize because I was literally there a few months ago. The final book that I have to talk about was my favorite book of the month and also potentially my favorite book of the year so far. I don't know if I'm gonna to read anything that's going to affect me as much as this book affected me. That is The Measure by Nikki Ehrlich. So I listened to the audiobook for this. It's available on Everend and it's narrated by Julia Whalen, who's one of my favourite audiobook narrators. This is speculative fiction and I love it when an author takes a concept and they explore it in a really in-depth way. So essentially the concept in this is that one day everyone wakes up to find a little wooden box beside them. Inside this box is a piece of string and scientists eventually work out that these strings can tell people how long they're going to live for. So it's a really interesting concept anyway, but just the way that the author explored it and the amount of detail that this book went into, I thought it was really clever and I loved how it didn't just focus on individuals, it also talked about the wider picture. It also discussed discusses prejudice and discrimination and it was really really emotional in places as you can imagine. It hits different when you've been through a life-changing illness and you can relate to some of the thoughts and feelings that these characters are going through. So yeah this was the easiest five stars that I've given this year and I would be really surprised if it's not my favourite book of the year. It was so thought-provoking and I think a lot of people would really love this one. So yeah, that does bring me to the end of this wrap up. Let me know in the comments if you've read any of these books and what you thought of them. Don't forget to give this video a thumbs up if you liked it and click subscribe if you would like to see more videos from me, but otherwise I will see you next time. Bye! <laughs>